The very first thing, which we'll breeze by right fast, because this isn't the most important thing of number one, but we did sign, finally, this bilateral Ukraine-U.S. security agreement. That's right. We've uh, signed off on 10 years of support for the country of Ukraine. That's good. And eventually getting them into NATO as well. On June 13th, Biden and Zelensky signed the historic U.S.-Ukraine bilateral security agreement reflecting the close partnership between our two democracies. Today, the U.S. is sending a powerful signal of our strong support for Ukraine now and into the future. And here we've got build and maintain Ukraine's credible defense and deterrence capability. Just as our founding fathers envisioned, of course, that's one of our jobs. Uh, we are going to build and maintain their credible defense and deterrence capability. That's great. We're going to strengthen Ukraine's capacity to sustain its fight over the long term. What they mean is uh, us still just giving them money uh, for sure. Accelerate Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic integration, including through Ukraine's implementation of reforms to its democratic, economic, and security institutions in line with its EU accession goals and NATO's program of reforms achieve a just peace that respects Ukraine's rights under international law in this war, okay, and consult in the event of a future Russian armed attack against Ukraine. So I hope everyone signed up willingly for that 10-year plan to keep giving your money to Ukraine because that's what we're going to do, and I'm sure it's never going to lead to any U.S. troops on the ground. By the way, Putin did make a ceasefire offer I believe this was yesterday as well. Of course, it entails them giving up some of those occupied regions. The Ukraine would have to move out of those occupied regions. And uh, they're not going to do it. They can't do it because it's better for them to lose a few hundred thousand more people and then do it. That's going to be the plan. But the, the number one thing I wanted to do for number one is Lindsey Graham. That's the most important part of Dumb Bleep number one. Mr. Lindsey Graham... Let's hear a video. He he accidentally, actually not accidentally, this is clearly planned, but he told us the real reason behind why we have to be supporting Ukraine. I know a lot of people tell you that it's for democracy and they tell you that it's because then Putin is just going to roll through the rest of Europe because Putin is Hitler when Trump's not being Hitler. Uh, but the actual reason is something that uh, we're all a little bit more familiar with. And it has to do with resources and money. And Lindsey Graham just went ahead and said the loud part out loud because a lot of us already knew that this was the case. I think he might be the first one to come out and say it. Let's hear it. Uh, what did Trump do to get the weapons flowing? He created a loan system. They're sitting on 10 to $12 trillion of critical minerals in, in Ukraine. They could be the richest country in all of Europe. I don't want to give that money and those assets to Putin to share with China. If we help Ukraine now, they can become the best business partner we ever dreamed of. That 10 to $12 trillion of critical mineral assets could be be used by Ukraine and the West, not given to Putin and China. This is a very big deal how Ukraine ends. Mm -hmm. Let's help them win a war we can't afford to lose. Let's find a solution to this war. But they're sitting on a gold mine to give Putin 10 or 12 trillion dollars of critical minerals that yep. he will share with uh, China is ridiculous. I, I want uh, what did Okay, so that's fine. You know what? I commend him for coming out and being honest about this, and I wish everyone else would be honest about this as well. This is what it's about, and this is what it's always been about. This is what it is always about. When they're sitting on this gold mine, well, we don't want other people to have that gold mine, which you could make a national security argument for why you don't want other people to have that gold mine. Sure, sure. Uh, but also, it's very important for us that we have direct access to that gold mine because that could be good for us. And so, therefore, uh, let's... Let's waste a few hundred thousand lives. I don't support Russia invading Ukraine. Not a fan of that whatsoever. But also, it's not something I feel I need to pay for. Okay? This is their responsibility. It always was. And they failed to do so. But hey, at least we can get access to some of these minerals. Right? Number two. The LGBTQIA2SL plus pride murals. You guys have seen the videos circulating online of these evil bigoted, felonious criminals uh, that have been burning tires on these pride murals. Now, where are the pride murals? 
They're on, they're on the road. Okay, you can drive over the pride murals, uh, but you cannot do any such tire burning on these pride murals. Now, people are doing it on purpose. I'm not saying this is an accidental tire burning. I'm sure if you were to slam on your brakes and skid across the road and there happened to be some scuff marks on the mural, you're not going to get charged with felony vandalism or anything like that. So this is people intentionally doing it. Well, you know, this story is about some kids doing it. I've seen some other ones recently, a guy in his truck burning the tires on the pride murals. We'll get into that. But uh, teens charged with felony vandalism for leaving, get this, black scuff marks on the road. I'm sorry, on an LGBTQ crosswalk. And a scooter company is declaring this a no-go zone. You're going to lose power on your scooter because they were using scooters to do this. Uh, no LGBTs were hurt in the process uh, of this, but uh, maybe their feelings. I guess their feelings are hurt. When adult and two minors were charged with felonies after they rode scooters over an LGBTQ plus crosswalk in Spokane, Washington, and the scooter rental company declared a no-go zone to protect a mural, Spokane police said they were called by reports of vandalism on the mural, and they said they were able to witness some of the damage being done firsthand. They arrested three people, two of whom, whom were minors, and charged with Class B felony of malicious mischief in the first degree. Intentional mischief. Something that we just can't have in the United States. The criminal complaint said the teens responded with epithets when they were confronted by other residents during the incident. Investigators said there was widespread damage to the pride mural. But they've got insurance, I'm sure. Including black scuff marks consistent with scooter wheels. They have... Uh, conducted a full investigation. We are still waiting to hear final results back from the lab, uh, but these specific scuff marks have been found to be consistent with what are only known as scooter wheels. So I just want to let you, everyone know that we have done this investigation and that's what we found out so far. Photographs with the police report showed about 14 black skid marks. My God. Lime, the company that rents scooters to pedestrians, said it was instituting a no-go zone over the mural so that its devices would stop working if someone tried to ride them in the LGBTQ plus crosswalk. A scooter that enters a no-go zone will slowly come to a stop until the rider walks it out of the zone. Lime Director of Government Relations Hayden Harvey released a statement to the National Desk saying that the company strongly condemns the act of vile hatred committed via scooter wheel sorry i forgot to tell you to get your kids out of the room while we were talking about this speaking of kids this is something i think the kids do i don't know if you guys were like this when you were in your teens but if there was something that you weren't supposed to do sometimes you would do it uh, because it was something that you weren't supposed to do even if you didn't have any kind of specific ideology wrapped around doing said thing or uh, some type of artistic photo that you drew or something in the bathroom or whatever it was, you didn't really have to care about it. What you cared about was that it was something that you didn't have to do or didn't, didn't need to do, weren't supposed to do. And so I'm guilty of doing a few things like that. And these kids are as well. Now, maybe they just hate gay people. That's uh, That could be the possibility. The ridiculous part about this whole thing, because now you see videos all over the internet of people vandalizing the, the road, okay? I don't think it's a good idea to put a protected mural on a road that people drive over all the time. Maybe you guys can let me know if I'm wrong about this. But the idea of this protective mural that you could vandalize also being something that people drive over all the time is sort of asking for trouble and sort of looking for criminals. I don't know. You tell me. Um, the Babylon Bee did a good job making fun of this. Uh, this headline right here says, Man arrested for urinating on new pride urinals. Yes, that's kind of what we have right now. I mean, you don't have to burn out your tires on the murals. I get people are doing it on purpose and they're trying to cause a stir and cause some trouble. But maybe we just, maybe we put it like on the side of the building that's next to the road. I just I sort of think that putting it down on the road is a stupid idea, guys. I don't know about you. We're going to breeze through these because we have a couple long ones to go through here later. 
Number three. This one's called DeSantis Migration. Here's a post that says, if you're wondering why people are moving out of Florida, it's because Ron DeSantis is spending his time fighting Mickey Mouse and Bud Light rather than actually governing. And this is a video. If you're just listening, you're not watching right now. This is a video of cars driving uh, through a flood. Looks like it's going, you know, they got some bad storms and stuff like that. And right now, yes, uh, due to Ron DeSantis' attacks on Disney and Bud Light, he's not been able to alleviate uh, water pooling on these roads. Now, maybe some of these roads have pride murals on them and he's trying to drown them out. I'm not really sure, but here's cars driving through floods. I did see the problem here. I don't know if you guys noticed it, but there was, in fact, a car right there that's got a rainbow tinted rear windshield. And this appears to be the target of Ron DeSantis's entire plan to allow this area of the city to flood. Um, that's the only thing that I can come up with. So the first obviously stupid thing out of this is what the heck does the governor of the state have to do with the fact that there's floods going on right there? I don't know if he was supposed to have prevented climate change or he has stopped some of the climate change measures and this is the climate gods retaliating immediately uh, after Ron DeSantis. The second really dumb thing about this is th that Florida's population just keeps going up. In fact, at a faster rate than all the other states, especially when it's due to actual net migration. Now, there's people moving out of Florida. There's always people moving out of states. Maybe there's people who moved out of Florida because they don't like Ron DeSantis. Maybe they actually thought they couldn't say gay. And so they went to a, a gay sanctuary somewhere where they could still say gay. I'm not sure. And so, sure, there's people moving out. But the idea of if you wonder why people are moving out of Florida, it's because of this. Well, that can easily be taken apart with some simple Googling. Or in this case, it came from the community notes that's on the post. Uh, like, for instance, from 2008 to 2023, the population grew by an equivalent of 1.34% per year from 2008 to, to 2023. I think that made it the number four fastest growing state. I think actually it was Idaho and then Utah and then Texas and then Florida uh, from what I saw on this. Now, that's the overall population. That also includes like natural changes in the population. For instance, people dying and Florida has a lot of old people. And so you got like a population replacement rate issue that could be there. What about actual net migration? That's people moving in versus people moving out of the state, which is what that post is referencing. Uh, from 2008 to 2023, the change due to net migration was 1.29% per year. Uh, it's people moving out versus people moving in. There are more people moving in than are moving out. And just in 2023 alone, the change due to net migration was 1.68% plus 1.68% more people moving in than out. Okay. So uh, interesting on here, states where more people are moving out than are moving in. Hmm. You've got uh, Oregon. On here, I believe we got a Kansas, I believe we got a Pennsylvania. Those are sitting around zero ish. And then states where people are leaving you can pick out three pretty, pretty easily right here uh, New York State, Illinois, and California are actually losing people due to net migration. Hmm. That's weird. I had no idea why New York, Illinois, and California. Uh, would be losing people due to that. That's a, some kind of weird thing. They must all have something in common, although I can't figure out what it is. You guys can let me know at Good AM Liberty on X. Number four, veterans dish Trump. Veterans are dissing Trump as a draft dodger in a new pro-Biden D-Day ad. So this was from D-Day. It's a little bit old. We're, we're past D-Day by about a week right now. Okay. But this is pretty ridiculous when you consider the fact that his opponent 
also dodged as many drafts as he did. Actually, yeah, about the same draft dodging that Trump did. And so maybe don't throw, you know, stones in your in your glass house kind of thing. A group of three veterans slammed former President Donald Trump as a draft dodger in the new ad Thursday, which was released on the 80th anniversary D-Day. The ad was dropped while Joe Biden was visiting Normandy. Neither Trump nor Biden are veterans, but Trump has faced heavy backlash over allegedly calling veterans that were buried in France losers and suckers. Allegedly, he said that. He denied that he ever said that. But it's important that we mention that in every single article where we talk about veterans and Trump. Trump has also faced scrutiny after he claimed he received a high draft number during the Vietnam War, but he was exempted for attending college and for medical reasons, according to Business Insider, after being diag diagnosed with bone spurs in 1968. I'm surprised he didn't say, well, sir, your bone spurs don't matter because you're going to die. Uh, but that's not what they said. You were able to dodge that draft. Wow. That is just, that is just awful. I wonder if anyone else also was exempted for attending college and for medical reasons. Oh, it was Biden. It was Biden who was also able to dodge the draft because he was going to college and for medical reasons. Okay. That's weird. Biden not only received deferments for his undergraduate days at the University of Delaware, but for three years of law school and Syracuse University. When his education deferments expired in 1968, Biden requested a deferment based on the fact that he had asthma as a teenager. He did this in spite of the fact, according to his own book, that he, he was a star athlete in high school and in college, played intramural sports, and was a lifeguard in the summer. The asthma wasn't too big of a deal then. What about this whole draft dodging thing? I happen to believe that if there's a draft, you should dodge it. I'm in favor of dodging any draft that you don't want to be a part of. Okay. And so I don't, I don't hold it against either one of these guys. Well, you might say, well, other people had to go in your stead. That doesn't mean that you should be forced into conscription because other people are doing it. Oh, similar. I realized this when I was thinking about it today. That's actually a really pretty close analogy to like my, well, just because one person got out of taxes, it doesn't mean that you should force them to pay taxes because it's unfair. You know, you got to put them into the prison with everyone else. Well, just because all these people are going in the draft doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to dodge it. Okay. The, the draft is immoral. It should be always forever immoral and illegal. There is no reason that the government should be able to conscript people and send them to die. Okay. Number five, let's keep moving on here. Cancer charity is sorry after using the word cervix for the transgender community. Shocking, shocking stuff here. A Canadian cancer society is apologizing for using the term cervix on a web page for transgender and non-binary people assigned female at birth. That, just so we're clear, the people have cervix, cer cervixes, cervi. Okay? It's not that they don't. Services. I don't know what the proper... Is that the proper plural? Is it really? Services. Okay, I like cervi myself. I think that's a pretty good one. On the page dedicated to cervical cancer screenings for members of the LGBTQ plus community, the charitable organization explains in the disclaimer, they quote, recognize that many trans men and non-binary people may have mixed feelings or feel distance from words like cervix. The charity acknowledged in a section titled Words Matter that some members of the community may prefer to use other terms such as Front hole. Quote, we recognize the limitations of the words we've used while also acknowledging the need for simplicity. The Canadian Cancer Society wrote, quote, another reason we use words like cervix is to normalize the reality that men can have these body parts too. So, um, anyhow, 
I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna say anything else uh, after this. I'm gonna let the piece, the news piece speak for itself. Cause I don't think you need to hear anything from me right now. They're apologizing for using the actual word. I'll just leave it at that. Like that's what it's called. There's a scientific word for cervix. And you have one also. But it might have hurt your feelings to use that because you're a man. But then they try to back up their usage of the word by saying, well, we're trying to affirm the fact that men also have services. That's what's happening right now, folks. Oh, we made it to dumb bleep number six already. Doing a good job, moving quickly. As I said, we have a couple videos we have to watch. They're going to take up some time. And I've done my best to trim them down as much as I can, but I can't do any more trimming to these videos. How about an irreverent feminist manifesto for the 21st century? We've got a performance for you guys to listen to. <sighs> Women have progressed so far. And it's great that we're all finally equal. We've been fighting for this for such a long time. And uh, these feminists, they're up there showing that they can music also. Okay? They can... They can read music good, just like you. In fact, as Amanda pointed out, they are actually, keep this in mind, they are actually reading off of sheet music during this performance on television. As noted by the fact that as they move along through this complicated and wonderful piece, they are turning the pages of their sheet music as to make sure that they don't mess up. Because you would not want to mess up. And they can read. That's a positive. Okay, we know they can read. And they want to make sure that they're not going to mess up. And I want to commend them on uh, their achievements. Here we go. London Soho Theatre tonight. It's arrived here from Belgium. It's called Sirens. And it is described as an irreverent feminist manifesto for the 21st century. So have a listen and have a good night. brings chills you know it's the kind of piece that brings chills <laughs> to the body <laughs> just all over um it, it it is correct i mean they they did have to turn the page there you see this is when it gets to the really complicated um barking section of the piece and uh you know i don't think that we should expect everyone to memorize pieces like this when you get into a uh, this kind of complex world of music you know i used to read a lot of music off of sheet music as well when i was playing and i never had to do anything as tough as barking so you know i'm not going to judge them at all i uh i guess this is some some form of modern art here I'm not really sure. I'm not a fan of modern art myself. I know that this does, com does come from a play, and I'm sure they brought the best song from the play. Maybe the play has uh, other songs, too. What might be considered typical music. Uh, you know, but you want to bring some of your best work when you're performing on TV, and, and uh, I think they did a great job. It was per pure perfection. They didn't mess up a single thing okay that's dumb bleep number six thanks uh thanks amanda for throwing that in
Uh, modern art, by the way, is something that drives me drives me nuts. I'm sure a lot of people listening right now or hanging out with me in the group uh, as well uh, probably feel the same way you know, when you see uh, you you see it on you see it on X and across social media sometimes. And this idea that anything can be art, I guess that's true. Art is subjective. A lot of times, I feel like people push that boundary, and the boundary is not really the art. The boundary is how far to the dumb side of the scale, ridiculous side of the scale, can I go and still get people to act like this is art? And I think that is the actual art form that they are performing. It's not the art, really. It's testing people's judgment and limitations and making sure uh, that they're down with this philosophy. So um, anyhow... That's how I feel about modern art. Number seven, we made it to the, the Blackhawks section. So we got four more here. A couple of them are going to have videos. There's a hockey team with a very, um, a very controversial name. Okay, some of these teams have given up on their very controversial names, but the Blackhawks have not given up on that name. And these... Ardent racists are going to do whatever they can to keep this. They're so racist. <laughs> How racist are they? They're so, they're so racist that they named this team the Chicago Black, Blackhawks. And by the way, thanks for Costco uh, for, for doing all the research on this. Uh, I think this was the best way to sum it up. But the Blackhawks name comes from Chief Blackhawk, a uh, Sauk Native American leader who was a prominent figure in Illinois history, the team's founder, Frederick McLaughlin, named the team in 1926 in honor of the U.S. 86th Infantry Division, which was nicknamed the Blackhawk Division during World War I in recognition of Blackhawk's legacy. McLaughlin had served in the division, and the name was one of the many sports team names that used Native Americans as icons. Now, I think that there is a good way to do this and a bad way to do this. There are actual people throughout our history that you could want to honor by naming a team after them. They were so fierce. They were so amazing that you want to name a team after them. You know, you don't just want to name it like an eagle or something. You want to pick an actual person throughout history. And I think naming someone after someone that's a Native American is even a good way to honor some of the Native Americans that you guys know what happened there. Okay, I don't, I don't have to tell you all about that. Uh, but some people think that we should never, ever talk about these people ever again. And that seems to be where the great-granddaughter and direct lineal descendant of Blackhawk uh, comes down on this. She has denounced the Chicago Blackhawks and demanded they stop using her ancestor's name and image. Now, I think we're going to watch most of this video but just in case I happen to pull the plug on it early for any reason, it's also important to mention that Blackhawk's tribe uh, still exists. And they have, in fact, signed a deal with the Chicago Blackhawks where they are getting paid money for the usage of his name and a cartoon figure of his likeness, of course. Uh, so... His actual tribe has agreed to this. They were against it at first, and then they said, well, how about we pay you for licensing? And they're like, okay, yeah, that's good. Say whatever you want. Of course, she's going to say that this is them. This is typical, taking advantage of vulnerable people in society. They chose that they wanted to get paid for it. It wasn't exactly that their principles were that strong. When someone showed them the money, they were totally fine with it. So how important, if this is about uh, misusing Blackhawk's name and image and likeness, if it's about that, how strong were their actual principles on that when uh, a little bit of money actually pushed them off of it? Now they're in support. I don't know. You tell me. Let's, uh, let's watch this video. The Chicago Blackhawks franchise. But who's the real man behind it? CBS2 investigator Dave Savini. I want to tell you before we go into this, the reason we're watching this is because they're interviewing the granddaughter. And she says a lot of really dumb things throughout this interview and presents a lot of uh, a lot of the same arguments that we'll hear from, I don't know, people that are uh, on the left a lot of times. She also cries multiple times throughout the interview when talking about the history, which, so I don't cut in and talk about this, I think that's completely 
ridiculous, like crying about something that happened a couple hundred years ago, you know? Um, you weren't directly connected to that. You've never been directly connected to that. You know what happened to my family back in that time? I'm asking right now that you know, because I don't care at all. I'm sorry. Why would I care about that? They're no closer to me than anyone else throughout history. Well, the fact that we share a little bit of DNA or whatever. No, that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't get it. Okay, here we go. Track down a direct lineal descendant and great granddaughter of Black Black Hawk, the legendary Native American war leader from Illinois. He traveled to Portland to meet her, and in an interview you will only see on two, she's demanding the team stop using her ancestor's name and image. We took our, our names from the natural world around us. The natural world's where we learn everything from. With every brush stroke, beautiful birds. The hawk has a great meaning to April Holder's family. These are intelligent creatures. In fact, one of her great grandfathers was named after a hawk, Black Hawk, the legendary war leader of the Sac and Fox Nation from Illinois. He'd be your great, 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 great grandfather. Yeah, yeah. But now she can no longer hold in her pain. She's denouncing one of the most successful franchises in the National Hockey League, the Chicago Blackhawks. Yes, it is. It is identity theft. That's the contemporary term for it, right? The family says this portrait of Blackhawk from 1833 is the most accurate portrayal of him. That's him on the right with his son. And nearly two centuries later, April says her ancestor is a victim of a modern day crime. If someone were to come and take your name and use it for something and profit off of it, what is that called? It's called identity theft. April works as both an artist and an advocate for Native American rights. She says the team took Black Hawk's real identity and contorted it into this. It's a stereotype. It's a, it's a generic stereotype depiction of a quote unquote Indian. Native American. Her family, Black Hawk's direct lineal descendants, say the logo is not only racist, it's also historically inaccurate. To associate it with his name is to literally pick a specific person from my people's history and dehumanize them and reduce them to what, a cartoon? They say they're honoring him by putting that logo on those jerseys. I'm gonna dispute their definition of honor. <laughs> because that's not it. That's not how you honor people. Decades of public pressure led other teams to change their names and logos. That to me is not honoring somebody. That to me is demeaning. Like the Cleveland baseball team and the Washington football team. But the Chicago Blackhawks are standing firm in their decision to keep theirs. Well, it's not okay to be racist. Just because Native Americans are a small demographic of the U.S. public doesn't mean we don't exist and we don't have feelings. And, and nobody's contacted anyone in your family, direct, direct lineal? Not to my knowledge, no. Not even after this statue outside the United Center was defaced in protest over the team's use of Black Hawk as a mascot in 2020. I don't know who did it, but I'm proud of them. She says Black Hawk was a man of courage and a diplomat. He's very eloquent, well-spoken, and extremely intelligent. A war leader who fought to prevent like the United Obama. States from taking his tribe's land. They massacred our people there. She remembers visiting that land as a little girl with her mom and grandmother. They massacred women and children there. But it's just a park now. This is Black Hawk State Historic Site in Rock Island, Illinois. Blackhawk's family's photos, his direct lineage, hang in a museum here. This is a picture of April's grandmother. <laughs> I like how she's like, oh, it's just a park now. He's dead. What do you want? He's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Someone in your family has a whole park and museum dedicated to them and a team dedicated to them? Good Lord. Okay, sorry. Mother as a child. A family honor that came with a price. Two years ago, we at the Chicago Blackhawks made a promise to step back, reflect, and reimagine our work and relationship with 
Native American people. Instead of changing the logo, team CEO Danny Wirtz got to work doing damage control with Native American organizations. One of the first things that became clear was our past efforts throughout the decades had fallen short. We had real work to do, and we had trust to earn and people to listen to. Then came financial donations to Black Hawk's existing tribe, the Sac and Fox Nation, which was previously against the team's use of the logo. The Black Hawks now have a partnership with the Sac and Fox Nation. I wouldn't call that a partnership. On paper, it is a partnership. Here's how it worked. Beginning in 2020, Wirtz paid Nina Sanders, a Native American consultant. What does that mean I wouldn't call that a partnership? It's literally a partnership. They signed a deal. They brought contracts. They signed it over. They could choose their remain principal and say that they need to get rid of this, or they could say, well, this money is more important. It's, it's, it's literally a, it's literally a partnership. Sultan, $14,000 a month to help the team improve their relationship with the community. You told the team leadership of the Chicago Blackhawks that the logo has to go? Yeah, and they still hired me. I told him that it was racist. Initially, Nina says Wirtz told her he would change the logo. But after she set up a 2021 meeting with the tribe, all that changed. The tribal government then voted to approve the team's use of Black Hawk's name as a mascot. Soon after, the money and gifts started pouring in. I feel like when these, when these teams, these corporations, seek out to do these types of things, to find their sellouts, they will look for people who are vulnerable to do that too. Neither the team nor the tribe would tell us just how much the Chicago Blackhawks have paid them over the years. The CBS2 investigators use public records from the Illinois Attorney General's office to trace the funds. Here's what we know. The team's charitable arm, the Chicago Blackhawks Foundation, sent at least $600,000 in cash and gifts to the tribe since 2021. Do you believe the reason they went to visit the SAC and Fox Nation tribal government was to honor or to buy the right to continue to keep using? I think it was to buy. I think it was to buy. There's no honor in what they're doing. It was to buy it. Included in those gifts, this $220,000 decommissioned U.S. military Blackhawk helicopter, gifted to the tribe by Wirtz and the team's charity. Wirtz was there as it was placed as a monument on tribal land. Oh, I see a total contradiction. <laughs> he waged war against the U.S. government. He fought the cavalry. I think that that hockey team has unethical practices. They did what's been done to native people throughout history. They handpicked a few people and they persuaded them through unethical means to get what they want. So, Okay, I think that about covers it. Um, I don't know how else she wants anyone to honor this guy who went by the name of Black Hawk. Uh, they should just say it's a different guy. The like, oh, it's not that guy. It's a, just a fictional. We heard some other guy went by Black Hawk also, so we'll do that. Um, his actual tribe signed a deal because they decided that so far, what they've been paid since, what year was it? 2021, I think is what it said. I can't remember the year. Um, $600,000 plus a, and a helicopter, <laughs> you know. Uh, as a monument, a Black Hawk helicopter, which is weird. I'll agree with that one. Uh, they would rather have the $600,000. And this lady right here is saying, no, it's, it's better that they don't use the name and that Black Hawk's actual existing tribe doesn't get any of that money. And, and what? And what after that? There's no time machine. I guess you could say if you're not pursuing a time machine where we can go back in time and change the course of history, uh, then you're not actually honoring him. Oh, there's no time machine. I'm sorry. There's just no way. There's no other way to fix this. And she's basically deciding to be better for that tribe to have no money than to be getting paid from it. Um, it's completely ridiculous. And I think what's actually happening here is that she's trying to make some noise. And why is she trying to make some noise? Because she ain't in the tribe. And there's an actual tribe that's getting money. And here she is, a direct descendant of Black Hawk. And she would also like to get in on the money. I would be very interested in what would happen if they were to come to her and offer her a million dollars, you know, or a hundred thousand dollars a year to shut the hell up. You think she thinks she wouldn't take it? 
eh, maybe maybe at this point she wouldn't take it, but um, she'd be really stupid not to. And I think it's totally fine that we name teams after people in a way to honor them. She seems to have a lot of issues with the logo of the team. It's a it's a cart cartoonized logo. Like it is literally a cartoon logo. Okay, you know it's a it's it's a sports logo. I don't think actually printing a picture of the guy and putting it on the uniforms is going to look quite as cool. All right. Um, maybe present, yeah, like what Costco just said. Let's try and make it a little bit better. Maybe you don't like some of the uh, accentuated features on the logo. Maybe it doesn't perfectly match the shape of his face. Well, let's make the same kind of logo uh, that would actually look like a side profile of the actual Blackhawk because apparently we have some paintings of him, I guess. And, um, and let's see, let's see what, let's see what that logo looks like. Let's see if that's the actual problem. I don't know if it is or not. <sighs> yeah. These people just need to go away. I'm sorry. We got another one here. We got eight, nine and 10 still coming up. So we got to go look at that. We just hit 43 minutes. I knew that was going to take up some time for sure. We got to move on. Number eight. This comes from Josh Ellis. I think Amanda posted this in the group. I saw this actually the week before, and it almost made it into Dumb Bleep last week. Um, I hadn't read the entire thread, though. I only read the first tweet. And uh, this time, I actually decided to open up the thread and read the tweet thread itself. So Josh Ellis says, So let's imagine the scenario of how capitalism actually works, kids. You ready? I'm a pharma guy, and my company creates a drug a drug that can save the lives of people who are going to die if they don't get it. It costs $5 per dose to make. My guys say we should sell it for $15,000 per dose. We'll keep moving on. We'll follow this chain of logic here. I can sell it for whatever price I want to because anything else is communist devilry. So I put it out on the market. You should be able to charge whatever you want to for it and see what the market says about that. Okay, but here's a strange problem. The disease it cures mainly seems to afflict poor and the uninsured people. So what do I do? See, he's got a market problem there. He's got a drug that cost him $5 to make. Apparently there was no R&D involved with the drug whatsoever. Uh, didn't have to pay for all the clinical trials and all that kind of stuff. It cost $5 to make. We just have to accept that. And um, now we can't sell it for 15 k because it mostly affects poor people. He says, do I lower the price and sell it for, say, $10 a dose? No, because that would produce an insufficient profit to satisfy my shareholders and my board. Shareholders would never go for a 100% a <laughs> markup on something. Jeez. Uh, my fiduciary duty to them is my sole responsibility in this situation, aside from not breaking the law. And uh, parentheses here says, even if that isn't true, I can break the law so long as the fines we pay for doing so are less than the profits we make for breaking the law in the first place. So what do I do here? You might think there's a dilemma, but there's no dilemma at all. Here's his answer. This is capitalism, folks. He stops making the drug. That's it. Okay. He said, I stopped making the drug that can save people's lives, not because it isn't profitable to do so, but it's not profitable enough for my shareholders whose wishes are of paramount importance legally and financially. If I say to hell with you, I'm going to make it anyway and save lives and still make a profit. Not only can I be fired in theory, I could be sued for mismanaging their investment for them and probably both will happen, right? By the way, your drug company that he's running probably doesn't only have one drug and they would be happy to have a drug where they had a hundred percent markup on it and actually only cost them $5 to make that they apparently didn't have to put any R and D into whatsoever. But anyway, now imagine that I'm one of the people with the disease this drug treats without it. I'm dead. I couldn't afford it at full price and now they've discontinued marketing it. So I can't get it at any price. I'm going to die because someone's ROI was too low. What is my value proposition for not walking into that C-suite with an AR-15 and a pound of Simtex and demanding that they give or make me a lifetime supply of the drug since I'm dead anyway if they don't? What? It'll disappoint Jesus? He'll forgive me. The answer is none. That's his value proposition there. If you have what I need and I'll die if I don't get it and refuse 
and you refuse to sell it to me at the price I can afford, you're condemning me to death. The most moral and ethical choice here is to take it from you for free by any means necessary. Now you're capitalism's bitch, not me. First off, he would also have to compel all the people that produce the drug uh, to go and produce the drug also and then compel the company to sell it to him. But this is a hostage negotiation here. Uh, so we'll assume, <laughs> we'll assume he's going to come out on top here. Now, maybe the drug company will try to find a way to satisfy both their fiduciary duty to shareholders and their moral duty to their customers, but they don't have to. No one under current capitalism controlled laws can make them. It's up to shareholders. You know, in capitalism, we have no, we have absolutely no cheap drugs that people that are poor can afford. In fact, you look out at people that are poor, they're just all dead. Any of them, whoever gets a disease, they just die. Uh, or if they get something that could be treated by a drug whatsoever, they just die because drug companies never sell something that's affordable. Uh, he goes on to say, which is why compassionate capitalism is a, I'm just reading what he wrote here, okay? He says it's a horse shit to phrase as benevolent, benevolent dictatorship. I'm not staking my life on some capitalist ethics for, for far safer if I'm betting with the highest stakes to compel him to give me what I need, not ask for it. If a company owns the water supply and cuts you off or charges you what you can't afford, why would it be wrong to cut into their pipeline and take what you need to survive? Because stealing is wrong? I'll pop that mf -er like a keg of bud with a song on my lips. That's what he says there at the end. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so first off, I want to go back to where he says, I stopped making the drug. He says that this 100% this profit on this drug is not enough for the shareholders, uh, you know, because it, it really only cost $5 to make and they didn't put anything into making the drug uh, at all. He says, so I'll just stop making the drug. And then what he, I'm going to assume that he just didn't think to the next step, but the actual next step is not that the drug just doesn't exist. Uh, what actually happens there is that the company sells the patent to a smaller pharmaceutical company. And then the smaller pharmaceutical company will make the drug because they don't have these big mega drugs uh, that they can charge 15 K for either. And they're looking to get into the drug market. And this company still wants to make money off of this drug because they want to make money in any way that they can, especially when it's something as simple as just selling the patent to another company, which is something that happens quite often. And so if they actually have a drug that's valuable that people are going to pay for that they can get 100% markup on, 100% profit off of it, they're going to sell the patent and another company is going to buy it up and then that smaller company is going to make that drug. So the immediate answer is not that the drug won't exist, but under his form of capitalism, what happens is that apparently there are all of these drugs uh, that people have created, that people need, that people are willing to pay 100% profit on, uh, that these companies just don't make and they just never exist. And that's simply not the case. Now, I like what T-Dub just said, you sell that the price that the market will bear. He's, you know, he throws out a $15,000 price tag. If the market won't pay $15,000 or people don't have insurance to pay for it, they're going to lower the price on the drug and they're going to find somewhere that the people will pay for it. If it's literally going to save your life, maybe you'll find a way to pay $50 for it. Maybe you'll pay 50 bucks for the drug. Maybe you'll pay a hundred for it. You're going to die if you don't get the drug. Someone else has risked years of research and development, which was apparently free, and put a, a lot of work into this to make this, and it's literally going to save your life, and it wouldn't have existed if they wouldn't have created it because you didn't create shit. They did. And then you're going to die if you don't take it. Would you find a way? Maybe, hear, let me, hear me out here. You cancel your cell phone plan for two months and you take a drug that if you wouldn't have taken it you would die otherwise okay so you make a you you get out your your notebook and you do the math on that 
and you say, well, it'd be better for me to not have a cell phone for a couple months, and maybe I'll cancel uh, Netflix or something like that, and uh, I'll take a drug that's 100 bucks. Well, they only paid five for it. Now you're talking about a much bigger markup on this drug. Now this actual company is considering still continuing to make this drug, let alone all the other companies that would love to buy up the patent on a drug that they're going to be able to mark up 2,000% on something. They'll still be willing to do that as well. So, <clears throat> of course, all of this, you know, when, it, when we talk about pharmaceuticals or the healthcare industry in general, things are too expensive. And that's the government's fault, and they're sorry. That's also the fault of everyone having insurance for everything. Insurance for routine maintenance shouldn't even exist because insurance is in case shit happens, not insurance for something I know for sure is going to happen. And when those third-party payers come in, they bid up the price because they are pooling the resources of thousands to millions of people, and they're able to pay a little bit higher price than everyone else is in the market. And then that leads people who don't have insurance for whatever reason to not be able to afford it because you're not competing against other people who are buying things. You're competing against an insurance company that can afford to pay for things. And so there's one really big problem there. Of course, I don't know how long it took this drug that came to come onto the market. It probably took it somewhere like 10 years, like most drugs, unless it's a vaccine that you're trying to force everyone in the world to take. Uh, but it probably had a lot of time and money involved with bringing it to the market, and we would like to dis decrease that as well. A lot of reasons all these drugs are very expensive, and we should actually tackle those things. By the way, none, basically none of those reasons have to do with capitalism. Because capitalism doesn't actually mean that you use an organization that has the monopoly of the use of force uh, to force people to do things, to force people to take money from others and then use it to pay for things, which bids up the price on everything. And so, no, that's not what happens under capitalism. Under capitalism, first off, this gets sold to a smaller company who buys up the patent and they make the drug because they're more than happy to sell this drug at the price that people can afford. If that's what exists. Okay. That's number eight. Uh, let's see, where are we at? 54 minutes right now. I could make fun of Josh Eckel real quick. We'll I'll put like a four minute time frame on this. I don't know what happened to Josh. I don't know what happened to him. He used to be a pretty lib libertarian guy. There's something about Donald Trump that so many people have bought into that that hatred for Donald Trump overtakes every single other thing that occurs in a person's brain. Scientists have been studying this now for a few years, and they came up with a name for it. It's called Trump Derangement Syndrome. And uh, there, there are a lot of people that are afflicted with this disease. And I'm not saying that we should mandate they get vaccines or anything, but there's something going on here. When it comes to a choice between Trump or Biden, there are many negatives to both of those. But there are some positives, kind of, sometimes, a little bit, with Trump. And I can't personally name any positives when it comes to Biden. And maybe that's how I think about this whole thing. Like, they both have a lot of negatives. A lot of their negatives are the same. Some of them are not. But I can't come up with any positives for Joe Biden from a libertarian point of view. I can't come up with anything. If someone can give me, like, I actually want to know. I would love to say, like, oh, yeah, that. I would love to come up with that thing. Now, I'm saying from an actual libertarian, like, philosophy point of view. He did dodge the draft. I don't know if that was out of principle or just you know, trying to save his own life. He's probably just trying to save his own life when it comes to that, not because he was against the draft. Um, I like people who have the self-confidence to poo themselves on stage. You know, it takes a big man to do that kind of thing. Um, okay, maybe they've done some good stuff when it comes to weed. And you know what we can go back to and we can say, well, 1994 crime bill, you know, a lot of those people or in prison because of him, you know. But I do like some of the changes. I don't know if Biden actually has any principles when it comes to that. Uh, but anyhow, 
somehow people have so much hatred for Trump that they, I, it, it shuts their brain off. And I'm not exactly sure what it is. Josh says the Biden administration actually did a better job of delivering on Trump's promises than Trump did. Look at Biden's results three years in. So this former libertarian, Josh, he was a super nice guy when you meet him in person. Okay. I'll give him that. Um, not only is he not just talking bad about Trump and the negative things that Trump has done, he's now giving props to Biden because now the hatred for Trump is not just a hatred for Trump, but it's turned into a, uh, a love for Biden. Maybe not, not a full love, but Biden's not Trump, and therefore there's a little bit of love there, okay? Here's what he lists off. Record low unemployment. Historic manufacturing boom. Energy independence. The U.S. is once again exporting energy like they were when Trump was president. The war in Afghanistan has ended. Stock market at a record high. Reduction of the Trump era inflation spike. The Trump era inflation spike. He reopened the economy after COVID and he got 70% of Americans vaccinated. And he did all this without once trying to overthrow the government. Okay. That's a choice. Record low unemployment. We can go line by line. Hit a few of these things. Okay. Record low unemployment. Right now it's a 4%. Okay. But it did go down to record lows. As long as you don't go to what the record low is. Just keep that in mind. It's record low unemployment as long as you don't count what the record low unemployment number is. It's a very important thing to do. Neither Trump or Biden actually broke their record on low unemployment. That was broken in 1953 at an unemployment rate of 2.5%. We all know how stupid the unemployment rate actually is. That The number is nearly meaningless, but we're using it to make comparisons here. Uh, Trump's number got down to 3.5%. Before COVID, Biden got his numbers down. Get this. Here's how much better it got down to 3.4%, which was last hit in 1968. Um, Trump's unemployment number was last hit in 1969 before that. So Biden was able to reach back into history record books one more year than Trump was. I hate it when people say record things when it's not the record but what, whatever. How about the other, the manufacturing boom? You can go back to several episodes where we talk about, oh, it's not fair to count the COVID thing because, not because Trump didn't have any blame, but because if a Democrat would have been in office, it's not as though they would not have aided in shutting down the economy. It's not as though we would have had less lockdowns or less people out of work. That's all you have to agree on. I'm not saying that Trump did nothing wrong. I'm saying, are you telling me that the Democrat would have been against shutting down the economy? Would that have been the case? No, would not have been at all. How about manufacturing jobs? We'll just look at that. Uh, during Trump's presidency, he added 414,000 manufacturing jobs up to the COVID crash. We're not counting it because either a Republican or Democrat would have had roughly the same results during this time. I would argue that Democrats would have wanted more lockdowns, that they would have actually used the federal government more to impose lockdowns on certain states. But we don't know that for sure. So since 2019, uh, the manufacturing jobs have gone up by 185,000 since our 2019 number. Now, what people are counting is since covid since that crash, uh, Biden would tell you that he's had 770,000 manufacturing jobs added. Um, all but 185,000 of those would roughly be jobs that were uh, recovered from people who weren't allowed to go to work. And so the actual increase from 2019 is 185,000 jobs. That's an increase of 1.45% compared to an increase of 3.35% under Trump before COVID. Okay. Uh, the... Trump era inflation boom or inflation spike. So this is another one that um, I'll be nuanced on it. Okay. Uh, 
Trump signed the CARES Act, which was a $2.2 trillion bill that put a lot of money into the economy and had a, a lot to do with the inflation that we had. Now, we didn't get the inflation much while Trump was president. One of those reasons being that the economy was still mostly locked down at that point. This inflation was going to happen. All right. And I'm, I'm kind of given, I'm giving Biden a little bit of leeway here. Even if Trump would have stayed in office, this inflation was going to happen because you're going from a time where people weren't conducting any commerce or commerce was way, way down from what it was previously. Therefore, the inflation rate went down to zero, actually went negative there for a minute. Okay. When you went back to having a normal amount of commerce, you were going to get inflation from those things. Now, what did Biden come in and do? He threw gasoline on the fire. You could say Trump started a fire and then Biden came in with a five gallon bucket full of gasoline and dumped it on there with the American Rescue Plan, uh, giving people a bunch of stimulus checks at a time that it really was not necessary uh, at all. And of course, we don't agree with all the stuff that happened under Trump either. But when you say Trump era inflation spike, that kind of sounds like inflation spiked while Trump was in office. And they're like, we got the raw data on that when it's not the case. It was like 1.4% when Trump left office. Okay. I'm not saying that that's because Trump was so amazing on inflation or anything. I don't understand what he means. Trump era inflation spike, record highs in the stock market. Now we've talked about how if you do an inflation adjusted stock market, which is important because you're looking at the value of your money that you've invested in the market when you take it out to live on it. Sure, the market went up by 20%, but what if there was 20% inflation during that time? So did you actually gain any money? during that time that it was in the market? That's an important thing to question. We've already done a whole episode where we talked about that stuff. We'll make a separate point on top of this. Record high stock markets occurred. Yes, under Biden's presidency, we have hit record highs. Under Trump's presidency, the stock market hit record highs. Under Obama's presidency, the stock market hit record highs. Under George W. Bush's presidency, the stock market hit record highs before the housing crash, but we haven't finished Biden's term either. So we don't know if there's going to be some kind of crash or whatever. It's uh, unforeseen right now. Under Bill Clinton's presidency, we had record high stock markets. Under George H.W. Bush's presidency, we had record high stock markets. Under Ronald Reagan's presidency, we had record high stock markets. What's the moral of the story right now? The stock market essentially always goes up. Investment advice for you. There is no 20 year span of time where you could have invested money and not have more money when you took it out after 20 years. Okay. Even if you started your investments right before the great depression, you kept it in for 20 years. You were still going to be in the positive afterwards. All right. Investing in the stock market long-term is you've got, I mean, there is no 20 year time span where you would have lost money. If you were just investing long-term in the stock market, keep that in mind. It's a like, as close to 100% guarantee kind of thing as you could have. Let's move on to dumb bleat number 10 because it's video and it's going to be fun. I don't remember who posted this in the group, but it's great. This video on YouTube is called Proof That Stalin and Mao Were Libertarians. I hope everyone's ready for that. Uh, so we've got proof that Stalin and Mao were Libertarians. I'll say a little bit as we go along, but we are getting a little long in the tooth right now. Uh, but let's listen to this guy on YouTube tell us about how Stalin and Mao, two of the uh, largest mass murders of human beings in history, uh, at least modern history, um, were libertarians. Stalin and Mao have the reputation of epitomizing big government. Could it possibly occur to you that every turn of their political career, Stalin and Mao strive for cheap, efficient, and yes, limited government 
at the expense of their own party bureaucracy. To not understand how Mao wanted cheap, efficient, and limited government, Mao who literally empowered the Chinese masses, as written in the Unknown Cultural Revolution by Dong Fing Hang, to literally set up their own local institutions of governance and ministry. Okay, for, I've already cut in here. Um, a limited government, efficient, limited government is when you're an authoritarian dictator who sends people out to murder all the other people that are in government. And what you're actually striving for is this libertarian form of efficient, limited government, a government that works quickly and swiftly, you know, because you killed everyone else and you want to be an authoritarian. It's much faster, much more efficient. Okay, sorry and power at the expense of local party bosses who they would literally put dunce caps on and shame Mao was the guy whose little red books were distributed forms of sovereign authority any idiot peasant could wield a red book and literally be the equal of any party boss in their local town nobody in china was experiencing tyranny from Mao except the people who were in power all the way in Beijing. If you're a local peasant, the average person in China, the only- Nobody in China was experiencing tyranny from Mao, unless you were a, a local official in power. So the, the Red Guard with their little red books didn't go around interrogating also the populace and murdering people, older people, you know, people who succumb to the, the bourgeois ideas. The, uh, was it four olds? I think it was four of the olds in there. I don't know. Um, all right. Sorry. We'll keep going. The tyranny you're experiencing is at the level of your local bosses, your local bureaucrats, the local people in power. And Mao, with his cultural revolution, empowered peasants to literally... I mean, it's literally like a Ron Paul audit the government, challenge the government. <laughs> That's what the Cultural Revolution was. Now, in the case of Stalin, you may be so stupid that you go around using the name Stalin without understanding the crucial context like the 1936 Stalin Constitution, which was the most democratic constitution in the history of humanity. And yes, at every opportunity and chance he got, he wanted to severely limit the scope of government and establish a cheap, efficient, simple government. He literally wanted to strip power from the party and give it to the institution of Soviet democracy. The party would be legally distant from power, it simply forbade the party from interfering in economics and working of the organs of the state. So look what Stalin says. Some comrades think that the thing to do is to simply nationalize collective farm property to proclaim it public property. The collective form was a civil economic institution, not a state one. It wasn't exactly private property in, under a classical capitalism, but it was not state property. These were collective farms owned by the people working on them. You may think the idea of a collective farm is uh, scary, whatever. This is perfectly in continuity with Russian civilization. Individual land ownership was a foreign artificial in uh, innovation created by Stolypin. Stolypin created the artificial institution. So, okay. Um, Russian culture, you know, didn't have a lot of private property ownership, I guess. So, <laughs> yeah, the state mandated collective farming. And by the way, you had to do the collective farming and you had to keep up with the quotas, <laughs> you know, or the state would kill you. Uh, different stuff like that. Uh, anyhow, let's uh, let's remember the name of this video is uh, Stalin and Mao were libertarians. Okay, keep that in mind. Of individual land ownership, that's what gave rise to the kulaks. We Americans like individual ownership, but it's not part of Russian culture. The collective farm was a new, in Stalin's view, socialist form of civil, civil property. The collective farms had contractual obligations to the state in the form of quotas, but all excesses to the quotas could be sold on the market. And they could do whatever they wanted with them, pretty much. Further, the collective farm is a cooperative enterprise. I like how he says they could do whatever they wanted with them, pretty much. What's the pretty much? I'm shouting it so you know it's true. What's the pretty much? 
Oh, first off, there weren't any excesses because this was a stupid ass system. And second, they set the prices anyway. You weren't allowed to sell them at whatever prices the market would actually bear. And then later, they don't even give them money for the actual grain. They give them machinery in exchange for the grain so they can make more grain. <sighs> okay, I'll keep going here. Prizes. It utilizes the labor of its members and distributes its income among its members on the basis of workday units. This property of the collective farm is its product. The product of collective farming. Grain, meat, butters, vegetables, cotton, sugar, beet, flax, all things that get to be freely sold in a free market on the collective farm markets, the Coco's markets. So you're saying, well, the collective farm doesn't own all these other things, the state does. State mandated pricing. All that means is they can't sell the land. They can't buy and sell the land, which is the good thing because speculation on land, which the buying and selling of land eventually leads to, leads to monopolies, debt, banking monopolies, things libertarians don't like. But as far as the fundamentals of a libertarian economy where people own their own products of their labor and get to do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> As most libertarians know, uh, the, <laughs> the state would need to mandate collectivized farming because we can't have privatized ownership of land. Libertarians universally against private ownership <laughs> of land because it's uh, speculation. And speculation, of course, leads to monopolies and monopolies lead to hate and hate leads to suffering. All right, here we go. With them on the market and shit. Stalin gives them way more freedom. You have more freedom when the land is public. You have more freedom when the instruments of, pu of production are public, depending on which <laughs> instruments. I mean, you, that, there's a range of what that means. In China, it's just the land. The there's, there's a range of what that means. What's the range? Instruments are not public property, for example. All I mean by libertarian is a general tendency toward wanting to limit the scope and scale of government and the powers of government. Doesn't mean he wanted a weak state. He wanted a very strong state, and he made that much as a, a general tendency towards wanting to limit the scope and scale of the government. That's what libertarianism is. That's what it is. And so when you institute your own authoritarian dictatorship, You've gotten rid of a lot of the bureaucracy, you know, and those, you know, democratically elected officials and stuff like that. You don't want those. You're making a streamlined, limited government where it is limited to whatever you tell everyone to do or you'll kill them. Basically... A Ron Paul revolution, if I've ever heard it in my whole life. Explicit. Strong doesn't mean bloated. Strong doesn't mean bureaucracy. Strong means simple, clean, and to the task. Stalin, relative to his contemporaries, was a libertarian. He wanted to <laughs> strengthen the civil institutions of the people at the expense of the centralizing state institutions. Stalin, and at the every who turn, disagree with wanted him. to give power to the people. And it was his own party bureaucracy that tried to stop him. That's not what Stalin wanted to do. Stalin wanted to deepen his institutional reform to be more inclusive to the masses and also more decentralized for the masses. He didn't want one center to dominate everything. Now Stalin failed. Stalin failed because he didn't purge enough. That's why after <laughs> Stalin's death, Khrushchev comes. Look what Khrushchev did to the collective farm as an institution. He I hate it when you forget to kill enough people. Oh, man, gets me every time devastated Soviet agriculture. They believe the conversion of property of individuals or groups of individuals into state property is the only, or at any rate, best form of nationalization. What does Stalin say? This is not true. The fact is that conversion into state property is not the only or even the best form of nationalization, but the initial form of nationalization. Unquestionably, so long as the state exists, conversion into state property is the most natural initial form of nationalization. But the state will not exist forever. The state will die away. And of course, the conversion of the property of individuals or groups of individuals into state property will lose meaning. The yes, as most, I think most libertarians agree with this, we must make the state bigger. And <laughs> eventually it will die away. That's what's going to happen. You see, he didn't actually believe that the state needed to control everything forever. 
He just knew that the state needed to control everything to bring about to bring about the libertarian utopia, uh, as as most of us do. And then he was going to give it back to the people, you know. Okay, we're almost there. Ask us to extend these rudiments of product exchange to all branches of agriculture and develop them into a broad system under which the collective farms would receive for their products not only money but also manufacturers they need. Holy fuck! This like is kind of like the Hamiltonian system that the LaRouche <laughs> people always want to talk about. You know what's so insane about Stalin's proposal? He's saying we want to incentivize surpluses of production in return of peasants yeah. selling their surpluses to the state. Not only are they going to get money, which, I mean, can the state really compete with the market price? Probably not. So how does Stalin <laughs> propose to overcome the market economy? Use the state to- We've made it into the point where the- the, these collectivized farmers can't sell their stuff on the market anymore. They got to sell their excesses to the state, you know, because this was so terrible and people were starving to death, millions of them, uh, that now they're going to sell it to the state. But he's saying, well, not only are they going to give money, but they're also going to get equipment. In fact, not only did they not get money, uh, they just got equipment. And of course, the state couldn't compete with the actual market price. That's why they made the market price illegal. So they, oh, just mandated that you worked under threat of death in exchange. They would give you more tools to work under threat of death. It's a pretty good system. It's a rather Hamiltonian. If you ask me exchange the products that come from the collective farms for manufacturers and instruments of production in other words technology <laughs> that overall increases the forces of production the state invests in the technology and it's up to the people to make the profit and they have an incentive and it's not based in force it's based in an exchange it's he not literally based in calls force. it products exchange <laughs> stalin is a fucking libertarian for all <laughs> intents and purposes and if you don't think he's a libertarian he's at least libertarian in comparison with the caricature painted of Stalin as a guy who wants to create this totalizing state that just fucking owns everything. No, he doesn't. Stalin <laughs> wants to deepen the avenues of exchange. He wants to respect or else. forms of property that are outside of the state and deepen those forms of property. <laughs> Okay, let's start getting the vote. <laughs> let's start getting the votes in. I think I'd said enough of my piece uh, during the video. That's great. It's so much more fun to watch it with friends and watch all the comments come in. You want to join the Fed Haters Club? Join gmail.com. Uh, let's uh, let's go to the voting channel. Number one was uh, Lindsey Graham on Ukraine. Number two was the uh, LGBTQIA 2SL plus murals. Uh, number three was DeSantis migration. Number four was the draft dodger, Donald Trump. Number five, the cancer charity. Number six, the uh, the feminist music. You guys know. Uh, number seven, Blackhawk. Number eight, the uh, threat on capitalism and the pharma bro. Number nine was uh, Josh Eckel posting Biden's wins, and number ten was Stalin and Mao. Uh, of course, actually being libertarians. Everyone go to the group and get your votes in. That video is, that video is uh, priceless. And I know it didn't just happen this week. I think it's been out. It's been out for a bit. And by the way, from everything I can tell, this is not a troll. This is a legit argument that someone is making. Okay. And it's, uh, as I told you, I think we gotta, we've got a contender or something that's probably going to make it to December. Okay. I've got, I've got high hopes for this one right now. I think it might make it to December. So, but Hey, maybe he wins Dumbly for the year. We send him a trophy and, uh, invite him on the show. Something like that. We could do that. Uh, anyhow, go to join gmail.com so you can hang out and so you could vote like all the fed haters are doing right now. The fed haters club is the number one destination for fed haters. So you want to go there. Unless you like feds or you are a fed. Right now, I suspect that many people who are not going to join gml.com and paying seven bucks a month so we can continue doing this show uh, are in fact feds. And so you want to go to the uh, Fed Haters Club, join gml.com. You could also go to godhatesfeds.com. 
If you don't get the, uh, if you don't kind of get the theme here, it has a lot to do with feds and hating them. And uh, also God, GodHatesFeds.com. You can see the shirt I'm wearing right now. See, I wanted to switch to this one so you could see the full logo. When I wear the full shirt on screen, you only see God hates and then something that starts with F and then the table blocks the rest of it. And so I got this one right here. You can see the full God Hates Feds logo and you can get the same shirt at GodHatesFeds.com or you can get the full print t-shirt as well, along with all kinds of other great shirts as well. Promo code 25PRIDE gets you 25% off on all the God Hates Feds merchandise. Okay, shocker. Stalin and Mao are actually libertarians as the winner for this week. Thank, thank you so much for everyone who is hanging out with us right now, everyone who is listening on their favorite podcast app. I did a poll yesterday. Didn't get like a ton of votes or anything, but most people answered that they use Spotify to listen to podcasts. I've never been a fan of Spotify's podcast app, but you know, that's fine. That's fine. Seems like a lot of people are using it. A lot of people put other I don't even know what the other apps are, but we're available on all of them. You probably know that because you're listening on that podcast app right now. Leave us a rating and review on that podcast, or at least, at least a rating. But if you're on Apple, make sure you leave a review as well. We'll be right back here again on Monday, same Liberty time, which is whenever we want and same Liberty channel, which is good morning Liberty until then have a great weekend and a good morning Liberty. She knew, lost, she knew so long as she was denied, our freedom can never be secured. She